Oh, okay guys, so we just got cut off from our previous video. I got a phone call because I stupidly forgot to put on Do Not Disturb. So, um, MedCram just put out a Q&A uh, with Dr. Roger Schwelt. And there's some interesting things that got brought up there. I want to put some light on a couple of topics. The first one I think is really important. The, uh, there was a question about Florida and the spiking of COVID in Florida. Now, just to be clear here, um, and, they, and Dr. Schwartz said, you know, it's disappointing that we're seeing this because we really thought that vitamin D was going to be protective with all this sunlight. Now, he said it's possible that what's really going on here is that because it's so hot, people are just going indoors and not getting the sunlight. Well, that's possible. But you know what else is possible? People putting on sunscreen. You know how much vitamin D3 you're getting once you put on sunscreen? almost zero. So what else happens um, when it gets real hot? Yes, people go inside, you know, they, they tend to cover this, themselves up, but you gotta remember what maps onto vitamin D3 absorption, how old you are. The older you are, the harder it is to, for your skin to absorb. Obesity, so old, obesity, there's genetic polymorphisms, how dark your skin is, all these things map onto how well you absorb vitamin D3. But here's the thing that's really upsetting. And it's upsetting because he makes the point about a NAC study later on in the video. He's, he's not saying it. Yes, this, the incidents of COVID are spiking. Now, Jordan and I could get COVID right now, but we're asymptomatic. What matters most is not that people are getting COVID, it should be the death rates and how quickly they're recovering, right? What are we seeing with death rates, everybody? Dropping, death rate, the, these incidents are going up, death rates are dropping, which would tell you what? That vitamin D3 is actually doing its job, right? It's actually doing its job. And what's disappointing is that later on, somebody asked him, hey, Dr. Schwab, do you use take NAC and we've talked about NAC many times in, in these videos. And he says, yes, I do. He says, you know, the reason why is because in a 1997 study, they realized that with the flu, that people were still getting it, people that were supplementing with NAC, were still getting the flu as frequently as everybody else, but their recovery time was dramatically faster. Why can't this be the case with vitamin D3, everybody in Florida, right? We see the death rates dropping, how many, how many more people are asymptomatic? All because they're getting their vitamin D3 from the sun, right? So how we interpret information really, really matters. How we're thinking, yes, they could be indoors. Yes, it could be from putting on so much sunscreen. Yeah. Of course, all of the things that map onto how well you absorb vitamin D3 matter because guess what? You know what, you know what Florida is full of? Old people, okay, old people. So you don't absorb vitamin D3 the same way, ne never mind all those genetic polymorphisms. Now, the other thing is, is um, um, we talked in a previous video about using things like beta carotene and all the different uh, carotenoids that act as SPFs in the skin. So Jordan, in the other video, made a point about your skin burning. And why don't you just make that point? Again? Yeah, so I was, yeah, I, I interjected in the other video before we got cut off that if you go out in the sun after being inside in the winter for months and months and months and your skin's pale and you don't use any moderation by going out in the sun, you can burn your skin and everyone has obviously experienced this before and that weakens your immune system and that can cause a whole lot of other issues. So that might be part of the conversation as well. Exactly, and in a previous video, you guys remember me using this as an example when we were talking about PUFAs. We were talking about um, you know, basically crappy oils, you know, seed oils, when, you, when you're eating way too much of this, these PUFAs actually store in your body fat. Now you need these omega-6s, right? You need them, but we just eat way too much of them. These PUFAs store in body fat, they take a long time, when I say a long time, years to clear out of your, your body fat. I put links to, the, to that research in the previous video. The problem is, is that these PUFAs are extremely prone to oxidative stress. So I use the example of a sunburn. So imagine the sun hits your skin, you get a sunburn, you have all these PUFAs built up in your body fat, right? Now you're releasing these, these um, this oxidative stress into your bloodstream, not a good recipe. How can you help prevent yourself 
from getting burned? Well, again, slow and steady exposure over time to the sun. Use your carotenoids. And then of course there are certain other phytochemicals like things that you'll get in dark chocolate and coffee that can also be protective from the sun. Can you talk, why don't you talk a little bit about that? What is it that's protective in coffee yeah. and, and, and uh, chocolate? In, so there's a few different classes of compounds in the coffee and the chocolate that are both protective. When you talk about coffee, uh, the main class of compounds, the uh, compounds that make the coffee brown when you drink it are called melanotins. And it's similar to the word melanin, and it's because they are similar molecules. So you're consuming these melanotins from the coffee. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that in your bloodstream, they can protect DNA and cells from becoming oxidized by UV radiation. Uh, chocolate has similar things. Chocolate's also roasted um, uh, like coffee is, so you're gonna have the melanotins in there. You're also gonna have a lot of flavonoids from the chocolate, which uh, coffee doesn't have so much of. Yeah, why but, don't you tell, fill people in on what we were talking about yesterday with the uh, flavonoids and the processing of chocolate. Yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's brownie. true, yeah, yeah, that's true. So, well, okay, so fear bringing is like a separate topic, but um, when you eat like baking chocolate or- eat, No, I mean the, in the context of the study. Because oh, isn't that how oh, they oh. figured it out with the theobromine when they took... Yeah, this is for heart health. Uh, the, okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's the same thing though because it, it maps on. So, okay. So there was a study that was done that showed like the health benefits of high flavanol, uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate with theobromine removed and uh, alkalized chocolate. And alkalized chocolate is generally what people um, consume when you're consuming like a Hershey's bar, when you're consuming baking chocolate, when you're consuming, if you look on the back of your chocolate and it says processed with alkali, that means it was alkalized chocolate. When you do that process, it removes a lot of the bitterness from the chocolate, which is beneficial when you're, when you're making like confectionaries or you're baking with it, but that bitterness it's is- beneficial to the taste. To the taste, right. Not to your health. Right, because the bitterness that, that they're removing is actually a lot of the antioxidants. So those flavonoids are bitter, um, but they are antioxidants are protective uh, of artery health, they're protective of, um, of, of UV radiation from the sun. So, it, it, but it also showed that a lot of the cardioprotective benefits of chocolate might have actually been from the theobromine rather than the actual flavonoid content. The theobromine doesn't really uh, matter too much in terms of like some exposure though. I don't think that right. really, that really. But it was, but the way that the um, study was designed was they removed um, the flavonoids, and but the theobromine remained in both, right? Yeah. Which yeah. led them to believe that it was actually the theobromine that was having the heart benefit, right? right? right. It wasn't so much the flavonoids, right. it was more the theobromine. Why don't you tell people just quickly a little bit about the theobromine? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a stimulant, right? Yeah, it's a stimulant. It's, very, it's a very weak stimulant. So uh, theobromine is a similar molecule to caffeine. They're both xanthine derivatives. Um, it activates the same receptors. It, uh, but, but the thing with theobromine is that it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as effectively as, as caffeine does, so it has more peripheral effects like mm -hmm. on the heart and muscles and everything. Um, in so, so in other words, it, it increases circulation? It increases circulation, it uh, release, um, relaxes blood vessels. Mm -hmm. it, it's called a PED. Is it, like, is it a vasodilator? It, it, yeah, it's a vasodilator. Okay. It's a PDE inhibitor, which means that it can uh, relax blood vessels okay. and increase blood flow. So that's that would be the heart benefit. That would that be from the heart benefit. Okay. Um, and, and it can also be a heart stimulant as well. So okay. Some people use it to um, the flight as a pre-workout. But the thing about theobromine is that there, uh, so in, in studies, most people that are not caffeine tolerant, so in other words, people that don't consume caffeine all the time, can determine uh, can can distinct can make the distinction between placebo and caffeine at around a dose of 50 milligrams. So when okay. you give somebody a dose of 50 milligrams of caffeine, they'll start to feel like, oh, I know that I, I just took something that's not a placebo. With theobromine, it takes about 500 milligrams mm -hmm. for people to realize, oh, I'm, I took something that's not, um, so it's about 10 times more. Okay. So it's a much weaker stimulant than caffeine is, but you might start getting a lot of the peripheral effects before the mm -hmm. 500 milligram mark. Okay, and just why don't you just reiterate because people are going to start looking at the back of their dark chocolate bars. Yeah. Uh, and make sure, guys, you know, the, the closer to 90, 95%, the bar, the, the better. Remember, everything else that's under it's just going to be more sugar, right? So a lot of that dark chocolate bar is fat, it's good fat. Um, but why don't you tell people what to look for in the back of the dark chocolate bar in order to maximize the these um, flavonoids that we're talking about. What should what should not be on the bar? What yeah, words? It should not say processed with alkali. Um, it should not say Dutch processed cocoa. Excellent. Those two things mean that it was processed with alkali salts or lye or something like that to break down those flavonoids to remove the bitterness. Um, like you said, high concentrations good. 
uh, like 90% dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, and unroasted bars, there are bars that are unroasted. Unroasted chocolate has higher levels of, of antioxidants as well. But like with coffee, when you roast things, they generally have different right. antioxidants. Different so yeah. you, it's not necessarily a, 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 yeah. a benefit to eat only unroasted chocolate. Right, you could have both. The whole point of the context here, guys, is get your carotenoids from different fruits and vegetables. Um, even things like shrimp have carotenoids in them, um, uh, right? Shrimp has a lot yeah, of crypto, cryptoxanthin. Cryptoxanthin. Um, so that your dark chocolate, your coffees, these things act. Bait your supplement with your beta carotene. I take twenty five thousand IU's a day um, to help protect you from the sun. That way, when you lather on the the sunscreen, you're not getting the benefits of the sun. But also, we're teaching you some benefits for heart health, but guess what else is, else is really beneficial for your heart? The sunlight, why? Because it raises nitric oxide levels. We're not gonna go down another nitric oxide rabbit hole here, but guys, the point is that sun is out there for your benefit. And the fact that MedCram, I, in my opinion, missed the ball here is disappointing. Um, later on in the Q&A, uh, Dr. Schwelf is asked about, hey, how do you as doctors know that sort of the bell goes off that a new um, therapy is see, seems to work. How do you guys get the information? And Sh Dr. Schwartz says, well, we get the information from the WHO, the CDC, and then these certain private sites. He says, you know, the, the problem is, is that a lot of these sites, all these sites, the WHO, the CDC, and these sites, the, the issue is, he says, they don't want to be wrong. Now, I want you guys to pause and hear us out. What that means is actually catastrophic to many of you. So when you understand just some basic knowledge of chemistry and um, supplements and you do enough reading, you start to realize how the body works and you can actually hypothesize and create a theory um, that is reasonable without without harm right so in other words in other words a simple thing would be gee i i would bet that if i got more than five hours of sleep a night i would benefit and here's why you know i did two different seminars on why sleep is beneficial but most of you could figure out why that would be pretty easily other than the 35 things that i listed over the course of two videos there's no downside to making sure you get eight hours of sleep as opposed to five. Now, we could hypothesize that and create a theory that that would seem to really, really work. But the CDC, the WHO, would be very reluctant to release that information until you get guys like Dr. Ma Matthew Walker from Stanford who runs their sleep study clinic and does these longitudinal studies who then puts out that information and goes, hey, look at what happens. Then it gets released. You know. So how else might this look? It would be things like, well, we know that protein is the thing that builds muscle. But you guys could look at me and go, but Tom, you're the same, you've been the same weight for 20 years, ever since I've known you. How come you're not 300 pounds of solid muscle? Is it because I'm not eating enough protein? No, it's because you're not asking other questions relative to the problem, right? Protein really, really does. It really is the thing that signals for, for muscle growth, but there's also other factors here, okay? So the CDC would go, if, if, we didn't, if we didn't already know, for example, what protein really does scientifically, they would go, yeah, you know, in a, in a 45, 50 year old, 70 year old man, it, it doesn't seem to be signaling pro, uh, muscle building at all. So we, we don't really know what's happening here. Well, in fact it is. Right, because if, if you're measuring by how much muscle the person has over time, you're looking at the wrong thing because we know that hormones go down as you get older, things like testosterone, growth hormone, right? It's not just a matter of protein. You see what I'm saying? Similarly, when it comes to disease, is it one thing, guys? Or have we been talking about 80, literally 80 different things over the course of three and a half months now, right? It's not one thing, but if we, start focusing on all of these things and put them in their place, we get a better, bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I wanna clarify um, with you guys, in the previous video, I talked about um, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 and coagulation 
And I want to make a correction here. Now, um, don't be alarmed. We'll, we'll kind of clear this up a little bit. But I was under the impression that vitamin K1 um, uh, is in charge of, of clotting, which it is. And vitamin K2 is in charge of taking basically calcium and putting it where it belongs into bone, which it is. But apparently, vitamin K2 is also in charge of coagulation. And um, I was having a conversation with Jordan yesterday. He informed me of this. I did not know. But I also want to be clear that in vitamin K2, the whole context of this conversation was K2 with your D3 because vitamin D3 frees up calcium in the bloodstream and takes that calcium and puts it where it belongs into bones and teeth and things of this nature, which is great. But apparently it also has an effect on blood coagulation. Now, in your vitamin D3 supplement, you're gonna see like 100 to 150 micrograms of K2. This is such a small, small dose and that's really all you need. So if you're worried about, if, you have, if you're on some type of a blood thinner or this or that and you're freaking out about it, don't because that's a very small dose that's in those D3 pills. But why don't you talk a little bit about K1 yeah, and K2? If you, if you, I just want to also clarify, if you're consuming like uh, about a, a standard um, serving of like a leafy green vegetable, like especially spinach, kale, you're consuming close to 2000% of the RDA of vitamin K um, just from one serving. So if you're consuming uh, one of That's those- That's vitamin K, K1. K1 right. right. But if you're consuming one of these vitamin D pills mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the vitamin K2 in it, you're consuming a very low dose. It's not likely to cause you problems. And uh, I mean, it's almost certainly not gonna cause you problems. If you start consuming a ton of leafy green vegetables every day all the time, that's gonna probably cause some problems with your blood thinner. So vitamin K1 and K2, they're, they're really kind of similar to, to in, in a sense, to vitamin D2 versus vitamin D3. Um, vitamin D2 is, it, it still activates some receptors in your body, like calcitonin um, and stuff like that. But di vitamin D3 is considered the active form because it has the highest binding affinity to the receptors. Vitamins K1 and K2 are similar in that sense. Vitamin K1 still has vitamin K activity, but its most active forms are in the forms of K2 as MK4, MK7, mm -hmm. depending on the length of the carbon chain. Right. Um, but they do also have distinct uh, um, benefits as well. Right. But there's a ton of overlap between what, what they do in the body. Right. So um, why don't you also just uh, elaborate on what we talked about in terms of dramatically changing your, the intake of your K, yeah. vitamin K status and, and how that's a bad idea. So yeah, when you, when you get uh, prescribed like warfarin or something like that, a blood thinner, yeah. they'll give you some guidelines as to like what you're supposed to do. And those guidelines will often say things like keep your vitamin K intake the same that it was before you were put on the blood thinner. And the reason why that is, is because if you start consuming way less vitamin K now that you're on the blood thinner, you're not gonna, it's gonna thin your blood way too much because your blood is already at a certain baseline um, uh, coagulation, like the coagulation of your blood is already at a certain baseline before you started taking the warfarin. And now that you're gonna lower your vitamin K intake even more, it's gonna be way too thin. And likewise, if you consume way more vitamin K, it's gonna blunt the effects of warfarin because warfarin's a vitamin K antagonist. It's, it prevents vitamin K from, uh, from clotting your blood. Yeah, this, by the way, this topic uh, is covered in the MedCrim Q&A. Jordan didn't actually hear the Q&A, so it's kind of coincidental that this got brought up. It's not clear that, that this is what Dr. Schwalt is talking about. He, he's saying later in the video that um, people that are on blood thinners, when they get off of them, um, uh, um, be, be, because the whole con context here is, if you guys have been following the COVID uh, train here, um, that coagulation is an issue. So to use blood thinners afterwards would make sense for a lot of people. How long, two, three months? He's making the point that, um, that how you get people off of these things actually matter. And it actually is the same conversation we're having here because vitamin K1 and K2 have a lot to do with blood clotting. And if you dramatically change that, you're taking away the, the homeostasis of your body, which it, it learns um, how to monitor, the, how to regulate this in your system. And dramatically changing it uh, is not a good idea. And it seems that it takes many weeks and sometimes months for the body to 
readjust to, to the to these yeah. to, uh, yeah. amounts. And they tell you, like on, on Warfarin, where you can you can consume more leafy greens. You just have to introduce them slowly, slowly. over time. And um, yeah, so that, that, yeah, that's that's basically the, the the thesis for that. It's it's just you need to regulate your vitamin K levels rather than dramatically change them one way or the other when you're on a blood thinner. We're right at 20 minutes. Guys, thank you for your time. Um, please hit the like button. Please share because I think you'll agree there was some really important info in here. Have a good day, everybody.